Hey, it's good to see you and happy Sunday here on Everyday Mary, which is just kind of a laid back channel. This is not, I mean, my normal channel isn't exactly what I would call polished, especially compared to most other people who make ASMR videos, but it's, it's more polished than this. So, you know, instead of wearing my track suit to Walmart here on Everyday Mary, I wear my pajamas to Walmart. Basically, it's the level I'm at. Okay, I, I, I'm dressed like this because I, I went to a workout. I'm learning how to do the dance. I don't know if you saw the video where um, I went to this exercise class before Christmas. And it was 90 minutes long and it was all choreographed. It's not Zumba. Several people said, oh, that's Zumba. It's actually not. It's something else. Um, and this, this group of people, right, they have this whole dance that they do. They know how to do all these moves and stuff. I've never taken any dance classes or done any kind of dance in my life. I, I was never a cheerleader. I never did anything that involved any rhythm, really. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very good at it, but I'm getting better. I'm trying to go to these classes and learn how to actually do this stuff. And my goal is to be able to do it well enough so that I can go to the thing this coming Christmas and not feel like a complete lunatic and not look like a, you know, a goose having a seizure or something. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this video. I just wanted to tell you that's why I'm wearing this brightly colored thing. Um, it's raining outside right now. It might get loud. I don't know. So I was thinking about it on the way home. I thought, you know what? Go ahead and make that video now. I, there's never going to be a perfect time to make this video. Um, I want to tell you up front, if you are triggered by discussions about eating disorders, I'm going to put up, I think I have like one picture of me I'll show you. I'm not going to show you a bunch of pictures because I know some people who have eating disorders, they, they look for thin spiration and they look for pictures. I'm not going to put a lot of pictures up. I have one picture of me that I will show you back when I was in the, in the midst of, of my eating disorder when it was at its worst. Not the worst, but getting there. I don't have really any pictures from the worst. I was extremely isolated at that point and certainly didn't take any pictures of myself. Um, so I'm going to be discussing my experience with anorexia today. So again, if you, if you have issues hearing about it or seeing a picture or hearing anybody tell their story, um, don't watch it, but I would also advise you to get some help. Trust me, there is nothing glamorous or awesome about having an eating disorder. It's not going to make you cool. It's not cool to fake having one. It's just not. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It is hell on earth, and at least for me, it never goes away. It never stops. I still deal with it every day, and I have dealt with it every day for over 20 years. So it's not a lighthearted, fun topic. If you're here looking for a happy story time, this is not it. But I just wanted to tell you about my experience with it. And also to remind people that everyone's experiences with eating disorders are different. No two people are going to have the same experience with an eating disorder. It's a little different for everybody, just like any, 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 anything like that, any mental health thing. It's not going to be identical, you know, for no two people are going to have the same experiences. So you might say, well, I knew somebody who said they were anorexic and they didn't experience that. Or this other person had it and it was totally different for them. Yeah, it's going to be different for everybody because we're all different people. We all have different backgrounds, different experiences. We interpret things differently. We handle things differently. So my experience is not going to be the same as somebody else's. All right. The worst, okay, my anorexia really became apparent. I first realized I had a problem, I would say probably around spring of 95, 1995. I was a senior in college, and that was the first time I realized, you know, this has gone a little too far. And we're going to get to how I got there. And from, I've, I've been in therapy before. I have never been officially diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's what someone would diagnose me with. I don't really know that they would diagnose me with anything else. So this goes back for me, I think, and for a lot of people who have eating disorders, it goes back to your childhood. And I think 
And again, this is all my opinion. It's not a medical opinion or a professional's opinion. This is just, these are just my opinions. I think with the eating disorders, it kind of goes back to your childhood and it's nature and nurture. And I think when you have the right combination of each in a person, you can see an eating disorder manifest itself. Some people can go through the exact same environment and not come out with one. And other people can, you know, it just depends on the person. Now, I have always been, not always, but for most of my life, I'd say since puberty especially, I have been very focused on order. You know, I like, I like things to be a certain way. I do. I, I like things to be a particular way. And I don't know why that upsets me. It just, it just does. One of the good things about doing this right after an exercise class is I don't, I don't care if my makeup gets messed up. It doesn't matter because I'm about to go take a shower anyway. Okay. I wrote, I wrote my senior, I did my senior, senior project on, I do believe there's a strong connection between OCD or at least obsessive OCD tendencies and anorexia in particular. I do. I, th I think there's a connection there between anorexia and OCD. I really do. Um, typically with people who have anorexia, you see a tendency toward perfection. Uh, they they're, tend to be perfectionists. Um, you know, they're very punctual. They may have issues with anxiety. You see a lot of that in anorexics. Um, the main thing being perfection and control. They really like perfection and control. And I was that way as a kid, you know, as I've mentioned before, I grew up in this little tiny trailer with my mom and my dad and my brother and my mom and dad and brother are all pack rats. They're not worried about perfection at all. Nobody cares. The house was always very cluttered. But I could at least keep my room extremely tidy. You know, in my little space, my little room, I could keep it tidy and perfect and in order. And that made me so happy. It was a nice little space I could go to and forget all the chaos in the rest of the house. So that's something that's kind of been a part of me for a very long time. I'd say at least since I was like 12. Um, before that, I, I don't really know. Um, I'd say not so much. It was really around around the time of puberty, I guess, that I, I became so meticulous and fastidious. You know, I wanted everything a certain way, and I still do. Like if you if you look around my house, it's not super obvious, but everything has to be facing a certain way. Like every everything in here has to has to be everything in here is faced a certain way in my in every room of my house. I realized that the other day. Like even the bottles of stuff in my shower in there, they're all facing us the same way. They all have to be facing the same way, and relatively even. And, and everything downstairs is like that. Every <laughs> I never really picked up on that until recently. That I that I just I just kind of do that without thinking about it. So I had my little space that was neat and tidy, and um. The rest of the house was just, it was never dirty. It wasn't like a, an episode of Hoarders or anything. It was always extremely cluttered. It was always full of stuff. Like it was, it was um, a memorable occasion if the, the, the kitchen table was ever cleaned off because it was always mounded up with like mail. Like the mail would come in and they just lay it on the table. It was always mounded up with junk mail and magazines and old newspapers. And it was just always piled up with stuff. If you wanted to eat at the table, you just kind of kind of push it back to find room for your plate and stuff. It was just, that's just the way it was. And I hated it. I hated it. Um, and another thing, so I've had that issue with control and wanting things a certain way. And I'm, st I'm still like that. And um, my parents meant well. I love my parents. They meant well. But looking back, sometimes you'll look back at your parents and go, what was that about? What? There was no reason for that. What was that about? And I'm sure my kids will have similar things because nobody's a perfect parent. And you can't expect your parents to be perfect either. I mean, in most circumstances, you know, they did they did what they thought was best. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying every parent, but don't be too hard on them. You know, if you ever have kids, you're going to you're going to realize probably like I did, you know, Raising kids is hard. It's hard. You're going to screw up all the time. You're going to make you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say and do things you regret. It's hard. 
having kids made me a little bit more compassionate toward my parents. Like, I really think they did the best they could. They did the best they knew to do. They were distracted with a lot of stuff, their own stuff going on. And sometimes I think they did and said things without really thinking about how it would affect their kids, you know. Like, um, this was this was a big one. This was a I believe this was a major aspect of me developing an eating disorder. Um, I really do. But again, she didn't mean, she didn't, it's not like my mom decided one day, hey, I want my daughter to grow up and be anorexic. Yeah, let's get started on that now. No, she would do this thing. And again, I'm looking back like, why would, why? Why would you do that? I would, she, she explained why, and I'll tell you in a minute. Because I, I asked her about it when I was older, and she explained it. So, when I was in middle school, when I was in about eighth grade, we met when I was in eighth grade. I had my best friend, best friend in the whole world, best friend I ever had growing up. Oh, she was like my sister I never had. We'll call her Jane. That's not her name, but we'll call her Jane. So Jane and I were like best friends. We, you know, I would spend weekends at her house. She would spend weekends at my house. You know, we were always together, like as much as possible. We loved hanging out. You know, we were just best buddies. My problem was not with Jane. My problem was on numerous occasions, I mean, this went on over a period of three or four years. My mom, sometimes it was usually when either she was picking me up from Jane's house or Jane was being picked up from my house or whatever. My mom, you know, as she was leaving, you know, when it was just the two of us, she would go, you know, Jane is really beautiful. She is so beautiful. She could be a model. I mean, she just, she has this perfect, she has a very slender, perfect body. She looks like, she looks like a ballerina. She's so tiny. She has that tiny waist and she's just beautiful. Wow. And then she would look at me and go, oh, you're pretty. But Jane, wow. She is, she is going to be a beautiful, beautiful woman. I mean, she could, she could be a model. I mean, it's just She's incredibly beautiful. And I don't go around calling people beautiful, but she is beautiful. She would just go on and on and on about my friend. Like, okay, this is getting uncomfortable. She would just sort of, she would literally just go, you're pretty, but Jane, wow. And one of the things she would do, she would compare my body type to my friend's body type. And she would say, now Mary, I, you just need to know that when you grow up, you're gonna be big boned and beefy like your dad's family. I'm sorry, but you, you will never look like Jane. You know, Jane just has this beautiful, perfect little figure. And it was kind of implied that unless you were small, you were not going to ever be beautiful. You were not ever going to be as pretty as someone who is small. This was implied numerous times. You know, you will never be that small. I'm sorry, but it's just impossible. It's physically impossible because you got your dad's family's body. I'm sorry, but they're all big bulky people, which they're really not. I thought about it later, like, no, they're not. I'm looking back at pictures like they're not. They're tall. I mean, they're all pretty tall. Even the women are pretty tall, but they're not built. They don't have like a big build. It's kind of normal. They're just a little taller than normal. But she, it's, it's, so this went on over a number of years. And you know, it's hard enough when you're going through puberty. I mean, your body's already doing weird stuff and you feel awkward and gangly and you're just unsure. You know, it's a terrible age for most people. It was awful. You know, you have zits and just other stuff going on. And that was the last thing I needed to hear. Like, why would you drone on and on and on about how, how much more beautiful my friend was and how a big part of her beauty was the way she was built. Like she's little t and she was, she was very pretty. She really, she still is. Um, she was very, very tiny, you know, just, she had just a very slim, slender build, but she was still tall. You know, she was as tall as me, but much more slender, you know, she was, and she still is. Um, but next to her, you know, thinking about all these things that my mom had said, when I got around her, I just felt big and ugly. I just, I felt ugly next to her. And there were, God, there were so many times my mom would say stuff like that. And I, I got older, you know, as an adult, we were talking about Jane one day. And my kids are cutting up downstairs. If you hear, it's them. I don't know what's going on down there. They're, they're, I don't know. I probably don't want to know. Um, 
But there was this time that we were talking about, and we, we, Jane came up in conversation, my mom and I were talking, and I said, you know, you used to tell me that I was never going to be as pretty as her because I was built, I was going to be big boned and beefy. What was that about? Why did you say that? And she said, I was just preparing you. I mean, you needed to know what was ahead for you. I didn't want you to get your hopes up to think that you could ever look like her. I'm like, okay, that's, that's awesome. Um, thank you, I guess. Yeah, I don't know why I went on to develop a, an eating disorder that involved extreme dieting and weight loss. I don't know. That's, that's a mystery to me. She never made the connection. No, she said, my, in my mom's mind, I became anorexic because there's just something wrong with me. She said, you're, you're just, your brain is not wired right. You can't, you can't blame that on your childhood. That's you. That's all you. It's nothing that happened to you that caused that. It's just, you know, you, you would have developed anorexia regardless of your childhood. Like, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. I think it's nature and nurture. I think you have to have both. I don't think, I don't think there's an anorexia gene out there. Maybe there is. I kind of doubt it. I think you need both. Kind of like narcissism, like narcissistic personality disorder. I think you need both the predisposition to it and the right environment. And you put them together and that's how you grow a narcissist. Other people can live in the same environment and not become narcissistic. I think you need both. Anyway, let's not worry about my mom. My dad doesn't get off the hook either. This was another thing he used to do. He would make fun of me. And I, again, I don't know what this was about. I don't know why he did this. He spent years telling me that my nose was too big. He would call me schnoz. And he would make fun of me and say, you know, you'd be pretty if you won for your nose. I have not had a nose job, by the way. He would make fun of me. And this went on for so long, and I don't know why. He kept telling me my nose was too big. My nose was too big. He kept, he would call me schnoz. He would literally just call me, hey, schnoz, how you doing? And I'm like, you know, a little kid. I, I grew up with some serious body image issues that looking back, there was no reason for them. There was, there was no reason. Even if I had a big nose, why would you do that to your child? If you have kids, please don't do this. Don't do this. Please don't do this to your kid. And if it was done to you, that's messed up. That's, that's messed up. They, that's awful. Like, why would you tell me I had a big nose? Looking back at pictures of me as a kid, I didn't have a big nose. It was a normal, I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. But so, but the whole thing about my mom though, and the way I looked and the way I was built really, really stuck with me. And it was almost like at that point, a seed was planted, but it wasn't watered yet, but it was there. It was there. And it lay dormant until I was, let's see, I was 19. Started when I was 18, so I'm in college, right? And uh, I kept getting strep throat. I kept getting strep infections over and over and over. It's like I could not get rid of strep. And finally, my doctor said, your tonsils are going to have to come out. I said, are you serious? I'm 19 years old. He said, but I, I think until we take your tonsils out, you're just going to keep getting sick. Your tonsils are just shredded at this point. They look like Swiss cheese. They got to come out. Okay, fine. So now they told me my mom had to come down and stay with me and like take me to get them out and then take me home. And she stayed with me for a day or two. Now they said, okay, after your tonsils are out, you're going to have a sore throat for a while, but it won't be any big deal. You'll be fine in a week or so. You'll be fine. That was not my experience at all. That was not my experience at all. My throat hurt so bad and it was healing fine. It's not that there was a problem, but my throat was so tender. I couldn't, I couldn't swallow anything with substance to it. Like I, I was on a liquid diet for about six weeks. So it was like yogurt, soup, and I just had no appetite because the thought of eating anything, it was just painful. Even like soft bread, I couldn't, like, I thought, well, maybe I can hold a cracker in my mouth and let it kind of dissolve. Even that hurt. So I was living on soup, applesauce, yogurt, stuff like that for about six weeks. And slowly it started to get a little better. But I was still afraid to try to eat anything because it just, oh, God. Because once you start to swallow it, it feels like a knife dragging down the inside of your throat. And it was on both sides. So, um... 
it was a let's say it was near the end of that six weeks and I was starting to feel it was feeling better one of my old roommates came into town she had she's somebody that went off to college and wasn't ready to go off to college and she ended up flunking out well she she was my roommate she was a lot of fun but she came down to see me one weekend well she was down there to see other people but we had lunch one day and I would I guess it still burned into my mind I still remember we were at this restaurant I think it was Chi Chi's or something like that. And we're walking through the parking lot and she goes, oh, Mary, oh my God. And she's looking me up and down. She said, look at you. Wow, you look great. Have you lost weight? And I hadn't weighed myself. I didn't know. I mean, I kind of knew because my clothes were fitting differently. I knew I had lost some weight and I ended up losing like about 15 pounds. I didn't know I had lost that much at that point. She goes, you look great. And she kept saying it throughout the, the lunch. Like, I just cannot get over how good you look. Gosh, you look fantastic. And she kept saying that. And it's like, wow, okay. That's the first time anybody's <laughs> said something like that to me in ages. That's really cool. So I went home and I weighed myself when I got home. And I still remember the scale said 113. And I had, that meant I had lost about 15 pounds from the last time I'd weighed myself. I said, wow, 113. Holy smokes, that's a lot. Okay. Now, anorexia does not develop overnight. It doesn't. I really think, again, it started long ago. And here's where the seed gets watered. Because then I thought, if I look really good now, how good can I look? How far can I go? I still remember everything about that day. So, basically, it be that became my new my new obsession at that point was losing weight. I had recently moved into an apartment by myself. I had found a one bedroom apartment that I could afford and I had moved in there. So I didn't have anyone really to see what I was doing. I sort of cut off contact with all my friends. And slowly over time, I began to, this is hard, I don't, I've never really talked about it. Um, I started to slowly restrict what I allowed myself to eat every day. And again, I was extremely isolated. Um, I worked all through college and I was also a research assistant for two of the psychology professors doing animal behavior research. So I was very busy. I mean, I didn't really have any free time anyway. Even if I had wanted to hang out with people, I didn't really have time to do it because I was really busy. And um, so it was really easy to make up, you know, to be able to say, I'm sorry, I can't meet you for lunch or dinner because I'm working or I've, I've got this, this project I'm working on or I've got homework, I got a paper I got to finish, blah, blah, blah. And it was true. I mean, I really didn't have any free time. <laughs> Especially by the time I got to my senior year, I was really, really struggling that year. Um, that was a tough year. But in four years, I almost got a double major in four years. I was three credit hours shy of a double major in four years. And I only took one summer session class in that four years. So I've always been one to really push myself hard and challenge myself. And I'm all about, you know, giving 110% all the time. But I felt like there was not a lot in my life I could control. I felt like all these other things in my life were controlling me. And there was really nothing that I had any control over. But I did discover I was really good at losing weight. That was one thing I could control. I could control what I ate and drank. I could control the numbers on that scale. And I did everything I could to make it drop. If I, if I weighed myself... And I'd weigh myself numerous times a day. I was working out seven days a week, you know, at, at home. I had all these exercise tapes. I had a VCR, and I would play these exercise tapes, and I would work out at home 
when I was at home, I would work out. Um, I restricted my diet down to basically just dry toast and a little bit of romaine lettuce and that was about all I was eating. And Diet Sprite, I did allow, I drank Diet Sprite and I took diet pills. Um, this was back when you could get, um, there was this one diet pill, you can't get it anymore over the counter because it causes strokes and stuff, but back then you could get it. And the name is escaping me right now, but um, I took diet pills. I was not one to purge, I never purged. Um, I was, I just didn't, I just wouldn't eat. My brain is all over the place because it's like, why are you talking about this? Stop talking about it. I don't, I don't like talking about it. But I think it's important for anyone out there who may be going through this or who has gone through it. You are not alone. You're not the only one. And I know what, what a private hell it is. I would weigh myself and if, if my weight had gone up even an ounce, I would be irritable all day. I would be so mad at myself all day because I felt like I was failing. And I would just buckle down harder. I would just be more restrictive on what I would allow myself to eat and what I would allow myself to drink. Um, and I worked out and worked out and I kept weighing myself and weighing myself. By the time I graduated in May of 95, I think I weighed a, probably about 95 pounds by then. Um, that was not my lowest though. I kept losing weight after that. The summer of 95, this is a picture, this is a picture of me around the summer of 95. I kept losing weight through the summer. The lowest I got was 84 pounds. And I was so proud. I was so proud of myself for accomplishing that. I was more proud of myself of that than I was finishing college. I was very proud because I felt like I really had something I, I had controlled and done. You know, this is this is a product of my control. Um, my mom was worried about me. She had seen me and she said, you know, you need help. I said, no, I don't. She said, yes, you do. I said, no, I'm just anorexic. I, I was very open with her about it. I said, I, I know I'm anorexic. I know that. I'm fine with it. I don't want to be not anorexic. I'm happy with this. I like it. You're not going to take it away from me. And that's really how I saw it. And it's like this voice in your head. It's not a literal voice. I, I had someone once try to say that I was, that I was hearing voices. It's not a literal voice. But if you've ever had an eating disorder, you might be familiar with it. It's like, it's like talking to you, not literally, but it's like, you know, I mean, you weigh 95 now. You could go lower than that. You can do better than that. Maybe if we do a little bit more exercise every day, like do another 10 minutes of aerobics every day, or maybe if we start skipping lunch, you know, just, just take another, another diet pill. You won't get hungry anyway. You won't even miss it, but we could get it lower. It's like, yeah, we probably could. Let's go for it. Let's see. I bet we can do it. And I, I liked the fact that my clothes, I had to keep buying smaller and smaller clothes. It just, it, it excited me. When I felt hungry, it was a thrill to have my stomach growl. It was like a thrill. Like, yes, I can beat that too. I can beat that. That is not going to control me. I, it was like, it's like you're at war with your own body. But I, I, I did continue taking a multivitamin every day after I confirmed it had no calories. I even called Crest, the Crest company, to make sure toothpaste had no calories in it because I was afraid if I accidentally swallowed any. I know it sounds crazy, but if you've ever been through it, you, you probably did similar things to that. That's the reason I ate romaine lettuce instead of other kinds because it had fewer calories. And even then, I would only eat what, one little bit of it with my dry my dried toast and it was a certain brand of toast that only had 45 calories to it and I still remember what the bag looked like <laughs> um, I don't have any pictures I'm not gonna put any, up any more pictures um, 
So yeah, my mom said, do you need help? I said, no, I don't. She said, will you go see somebody for me? Just, will you please? I said, yeah, I guess. And this was when I was still a senior in high school. And she made an appointment with a psychiatrist. I don't remember the guy's name. I remember he looked like Santa Claus. And basically, we just talked about, you know, I'd never seen him before, so we're just talking about general stuff. And I remember at one point he looked at me, he goes, you're very thin. Do you think you might have an eating disorder? I said, no. I'm just, I'm just naturally thin. He goes, oh, okay. And that was all that was said about it. And it could be that if I continued going, he might have pressed me on it more. But uh, most people, I could just tell them that. You know, if they didn't really know me very well, I'd just say, I'm just naturally thin. And I could look at myself in the mirror and think, you know, I'm very slender now, just like Jane was. And that made me happy. That It really did make me happy. Like, I'm not big boned. I'm not beefy. I, I'm, I'm slender like Jane was. I did it. I did it. I, you know, I, I was just, I was like, I did it. I did it. I was very proud of myself. Let me go yell at some kids. I'm not going to yell at them, but they're down there. I don't know what they're yelling at each other or laughing or something. Actually, it turns out it was only one kid who's on the Xbox talking and laughing with somebody. It wasn't both of them. It was one of them. Okay, anyway, I told him to please be quiet. So I, I felt like I'd really done something. I would have to say, and I'm, I'm not saying anorexia is great, but the summer of 1995 was probably my favorite summer of all time. It really was. I was working six days a week in a factory. I was making really good money. I wanted a job between, I was going to go back to school and finish my English degree, but I wanted to work for a few months to save up some money, pay some bills, you know, stuff like that. I, 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 my parents didn't pay for me to go to school. It was made abundantly clear that if I decided to go to college, I was on my own. They were, my dad was very much against me going to college and my mom couldn't help me. So I knew I was on my own. Anyway, I wanted to work for a few months, you know, save up money, you know, kind of get a little bit better financial footing before trying to go back to school. So I was working in a factory and, you know, I didn't really know any of those people before, so they didn't really know anything about me. And I could just, and if anybody asked me, and quite a few of them did, a couple of them pulled me aside like, you know, are you okay? I mean, you, how much do you weigh? I had people actually ask me like, how much do you weigh? And I say, why do you ask? And they'd say, well, you're just, you're just so skinny. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm worried about you. I'm like, no, I'm just naturally thin. You know, I'm just naturally like this. And they're like, oh, okay. And so I didn't really worry about it. But when I got down to 84 pounds, I was still working in the factory. Um, I was having a lot of trouble with dizzy spells. And I think taking that multivitamin every day really really helped. I, I don't I don't know that I would have been doing so well if I had not been taking that every day. I mean, it was something. It was better than nothing. There was really no nutritional value in anything I ate. Um, yeah, I, I remember walking around in public like in a store and people just staring at me. People just stopping and staring. And I, I knew they were staring. I mean, it was very obvious they were staring. And I, I did look, I, I looked sick, I, I, I know I did, but I didn't care anymore because at that point it wasn't really about looks. And that's what a lot of people get wrong about it. It's not so, it's not all about looks. For me, the biggest, the most appealing thing about anorexia was the control. It wasn't about what size I wore or anything like that. Um, I could wear children's size pants and that, that just tickled me. I thought that was awesome. It wasn't about that though. It was about the fact that I had control. I felt like I had something I could control. Um, yeah, so how did I, how did I beat it? Well, you don't ever really beat it. I don't think for me, I, you, there's no cure for it. As far as I know, um, it never goes away. I still deal with it all the time. That voice is still there. It never went away. You know what saved me? It wasn't a therapist. It wasn't a pill. It wasn't any kind of treatment. Moving here, 
moving here to Greensboro for the first time. I don't know what it was. It saved me somehow. And I was better able to deal with something that I knew was not sustainable. I, I knew that, you know, I'm, I'm no dummy. I mean, I knew I could not go on the way I was. At 84 pounds, I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without feeling like I was going to pass out. Like, I would have to stop and rest. Most of my aerobics, I couldn't do anymore because I just physically had no strength. Um, I didn't have a period for over two years. Um, and as you lose weight, your body hair increases. You get lanugo like a newborn baby. It's like this downy hair because your body is trying so hard to keep itself warm. So you become more hairy. I was constantly having to like shave my arms because it was so bad. It was just in my face. Like I had, it was on my face and just, it was awful. Um, so I knew that wasn't sustainable which kind of made me sad because I really liked it. I like the feeling of control. But, fortunately, after, after I moved here in January of 96, I moved here for the first time. And something about being here just brought this sense of peace to me that I didn't have anywhere else. I didn't have it before. But it's almost like I felt like, you know, I'm going to be okay. I can make a life for myself here. And I'm going to be alright. And it was gradual. It was very slow. But over time, I allowed myself to eat different things in small amounts. It was very slow, but over time I, I was able, every day it got a little easier to not let that little voice tell me what to do. And again, it's not a literal voice. I would not let it tell me how to live my life anymore, but it never went away. It's still there. It's still there. And I have to be honest with you. Um, I've lost 23 pounds since August. And it's hard. It's like you're conflicted because, you know, I wanted to lose weight for myself. I wanted to get in better shape. I wanted to eat better. I wanted to get my body in better shape, exercise, build up muscle strength, and, you know, just become stronger. And I've done that. And I'm going to continue to do that. But at the same time, this stupid voice in my head is like, all right, we're getting back on track. We're getting back on it now. Good. I'm glad. And I'm just like, shut up. I'm not doing it for you. I'm not doing it for you. It's like, it, but it's a constant struggle because I, I weigh myself every morning, but I only weigh once a day. I don't allow my, and I want to weigh more. The voice is like, you know, maybe you should weigh yourself. No, I weigh every morning first thing and that's it. I don't weigh myself again the rest of the day. I don't work out obsessively. Um... I am not allowing myself to get back to that point, but it's always a struggle. It's like an extra layer of shit that you have to deal with that just sucks <laughs> on top of just regular stuff. Um, yeah, so it never stops. It never goes away. And one thing I do worry about, and if you've ever dealt with an eating disorder, it's something that might apply to you too. Um, you know, I have my kids here and I think having them here is a really good thing for me in a lot of ways. But one way that I never really thought about until recently was with my tendency towards anorexia, which I still have. If they weren't here, like if I, if I lived alone again, um, and I haven't lived alone, let's see, I haven't lived alone since I got married for the first time and that was a long time ago. Um, I really haven't lived alone much at all since I was in my 20s. So 
I've always I've had my kids here and having them here, you know, I have to have other foods here and I can I can say no to foods, but you know, I feel like, you know, I want to eat with them. Although with my misophonia, I have to eat in the other room, but at least we're eating at the same time. I, you know, that's a whole other issue. But I have found with my loop earplugs, I can eat with them and it's better. It's not the loop earplugs really help. Well, they really help with my exercise class with the one that pops her gum. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anorexia. It's just an added layer of fun. But I think having them having them here is a good it's really good for me. Because if I lived alone, I I know, I already know for a fact that I would be much more restrictive as to the kinds of foods that came into this house, and the kind of foods that I would prepare and eat. And I could see me very easily slipping back into that tendency. I could see it. Yeah, I don't think you're not cured of anorexia. I can't I can't really speak for anything else. I don't really know anything about any other eating disorders. That's mainly the one I'm familiar with from personal experience. Um, it never really goes away. So if you know anyone who's dealt with it, you know, chances are they're still dealing with it, but it's maybe it's more low key if they're in recovery. But it's almost like cancer. You know, it can always come back. You may just be in remission right now. I mean, I hate to compare it to cancer, but it's kind of like it. You never really think it's gone forever because it can always come back. Um, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. It's not fun. It's not fancy and glamorous. It's not desirable. You don't want it. Um, it has really affected my life. Um, yeah, so that that's my experience with anorexia, and it, it it's ongoing. You know, it's still there. That's why I say I think it's nature and nurture because it's not. You can't point to one thing and say, "Well, this caused it." Obviously, no. I think it's a whole host of things. I think it's complicated. I think they all have to come together in the right combination for the right person for it to happen. Um, yeah, but, you know, after I developed anorexia, my mom stopped talking about my body type and my body shape. That never came up again, I did notice, so that was one good thing about it. She stopped talking about me being big, which was nice. I heard that a lot growing up, you know, like I said, you know, I heard all the time that I was going to be this big, beefy girl. Aw, oh, poor you. You're not ever going to be pretty. Well, I mean, you'll be pretty, but... You will never be beautiful. So, at least I don't have to hear that anymore. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't really know what else to say about it. It sucks. It sucks. I don't like it. But it's still there. Um, yeah, so, what does the future hold for someone with anorexia? You just have to keep it in check, and, and that's going to mean different things for different people. You have to find ways, like for me, I know if I live alone, I'm going to have to be very conscious of it, because that voice is going to be a lot more insistent, like, okay, okay, the kids aren't here anymore. Um, that means no more snacks, no more chips. You can do away with all that. The sweetened cereals, the this, the that. You don't need any of that. How about, uh, how about we go see if we can find that bread that you used to eat? Maybe we can just try that for a while. And it's just its just always going. It's always going. That voice is, and it, it's not a literal voice. The voice is always there like, you know, you really need to eat that. I'm just saying, you know, you could just, you could just not eat that. And it's harder to ignore under different circumstances. So in the future, I'm just going to have to be aware of that. Because one day, my kids are going to grow up and go and... I, that is something I'm going to have to keep in mind. I'm going to have to be aware of it myself and be vigilant and not let not let this come creeping back into my life because I don't want it. But I think I think moving here, for some reason, something about moving to Greensboro gave me that sense of control and satisfaction with my life that I never had anywhere else I've ever been. 
in all of my travels, not like I've been all over the world, but I've never been anywhere where I felt so comfortable and happy as I do here, not even the place where I grew up. I never felt this way there. You know, I've known all my life since I was four or five years old, I always knew that I was going to leave. I was going to grow up in that place and leave. I was not meant to live there as an adult. I was meant to move somewhere else. I was meant to go away. And I came here and I feel like I just, I came home. And I am so glad I moved here when I did because I was at my lowest weight when I moved here, 84. And I'm really glad I moved here when I did because I don't know how much lower I could have gone. I really, I don't know. I'm not a short little tiny person. So 84 pounds does not look like much on me. <laughs> um, it really doesn't. So I'm really glad I moved here when I did. My last points, I guess, would be if you know anyone who has an eating disorder, be kind, be patient. Don't just tell them to eat something. Don't, don't do that. Oh my God, I heard that so many times. That was always my dad's advice was read your Bible and eat something. And that would cure me. Like, okay, dad. I'll get right on that. Why didn't I think of that? That's so obvious. Thank you. He meant well. He just didn't know what else. He didn't know anything about eating disorders. He didn't really know what to say other than eat something. Read a Bible. You'll be fine. Um, be kind. Be patient. Be understanding. You know, if you've never dealt with an eating disorder, be grateful that you don't understand. I'm glad you don't. <laughs> you don't want to. And... If you have an eating disorder, I, I would recommend just my, one friend to another. I would I would recommend seeing a therapist who specializes in eating disorders because not all therapists are the same. A lot of them will not be any help for you. Try to find one that can help you. Um, and don't listen. Don't listen to that voice. Don't. And I know it's not a real voice. Don't listen to them. They do not have your best interests at heart. They don't. Um, they will drive you into an early grave, and I would really hate to see that. Don't let them do that. Um, I'm not going to let mine do it. I don't want you to either. But it's still there. And I hate it. Be patient with yourself. And, um... Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Because we need you here. <laughs> Don't let it take you away from here. I promise you there are people that if you were not here would be very upset. It would devastate them. Don't put them through that. If nothing else, don't put them through that. Save yourself for yourself and for them. Sorry, I had, to, I had to blow my nose. I didn't think you would want to see that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, this right here is why I don't talk about it very often. Um, it's hard to open up and say all that because I never really have. I've never really talked about it with anyone until just now. You were literally the first people I've ever talked to about it. You're the first ones to hear it. I haven't really discussed it with anybody. Um, yeah. So take care of yourself. And don't don't let the eating disorder ruin your life. Please don't let it don't let it convince you that you need it in order to be pretty or in order to have control over your life. It's leading you down a dark path, and I promise you don't want to go down it. A lot of people don't come out on the other side. The suicide rate for people with eating disorders is very high. Anorexia in particular, the death rate for anorexics is really, really high. I don't want to see that happen to you. And even if you don't have anorexia and you have an eating disorder that is damaging your body in any way, please get help. You know, don't. Don't, don't let it ravage your body. And I'm 
I'm here for you. I know, I know what you're going through. And I only want the best for you. So please take care of yourself. Thank you so much for watching. This was not a fun story time, but I'm glad. I'm glad I did it. I probably won't be talking about it much more beyond this point. Um, it's not, it's not pretty, it's not comfortable, but I'm glad I did it this time. So, thank you so much for being here. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Please take care of yourself and the people that you love. I'll see you again soon.